Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sense of Place, Season 11, 2021. My name is Sarah Fox. I'm the host and curator of Sense of Place. And I want to wish you a Happy New Year. I'm really excited to have Bill Weiler join us. Many of you in the gorge recognize this name. Um, Bill is a longtime wildlife biologist, and he also started the Gorge Ecology Institute of 25 years ago. Um, he is a huge advocate for getting out and getting your hands dirty and learning about nature by being in it, which I love. And I think it's important for all of us, especially right now. Um, right now, Bill works as the education coordinator for the Sandy River Watershed Council. Um, and I think what you'll see tonight is that in all of these endeavors, Bill has an incredible passion for wildlife. Um, and it, I think the only thing that parallels that passion is his excitement at sharing it and encouraging it in others like us tonight. So I hope you will put down your glass of wine or your cup of tea and put your hands together, hoot and holler, whatever you need to do to help me virtually welcome Bill Weiler to Sense of Place season 11. Welcome, Bill. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Sarah. What a spectacular job and what a beautiful tribute to uh, the Lloyd brothers and, and Darvel Lloyd. Uh, in one of the Q and A's, someone said, in fact, my friend Bonnie said she couldn't see the pictures. I hope that that has changed and you can see things. I'm going to share my screen and we'll see what happens. Holy moly. Let's see here. Ms. Erica, can, can people see this? Can people see this slide? I can see it, Bill. Excellent. We're ready to go then. For what it's worth. Oh, and Bonnie's got it too. We're all set. Oh, thank you so very much. <laughs> so a deep bow to Sarah for inviting me, for Erica uh, Bingham from Mount Adams Institute for uh, doing the tech work tonight. Uh, I should start like uh, Steve Martin starts uh, a lot of his uh, shows by saying, I want to thank every each and every one of you for being here. So thank you. No, I think that's going to be more than 100 folks. So anyhow, I, I, one of my main goals tonight is I hope that after this discussion in future days, months, hopefully years, that we can continue the discussion about wildlife. So please keep in touch. You can see my email down there below. Uh, it's really important to keep this going. If you have uh, wildlife sightings, you want to know what they are. If you have a piece of property that you'd like to do more things for wildlife, please contact me. This is what we're going to do tonight. Uh, menacing wildlife. Uh, there's really only one species, really only one menacing species, I believe, in the gorge and the country to really worry about. Magical wildlife. It's actually just amazing. They exist. Magnificent. I think they're pretty much all the species in the gorge. In fact, magical you know, uh, magnificent, they're all about the same, followed by your comments and questions. But first, let's play the Animal Kingdom quiz with a, a nod toward Mr. Uh, Seth Tippett, who was here before we gave wonderful quizzes for prizes. We'll just do Bolstein rights. So we'll do six of them. Question number one, where do bats mostly live in the gorge? What are our wonderful bats live in the gorge? And this is a hint, they don't really live in caves because outside of Trout Lake, we just don't have too many of them. Well, on the west side, anyhow, of the gorge, they live in trees. They live under the bark. They live in the cavities of trees. Of course, they might live in sheds. They might live in your home a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a bat box. It's pretty thin and narrow and long and believe me bats through that little hole can go in there and they crawl in backwards so they can fly out uh you know head first so yeah bats live in trees they literally hang out in trees and i hope you like bats because every night during the spring and summer and fall bats eat at least 1000 uh, mosquitoes a night they really love mosquitoes and moths mix it up there uh, sometimes i've heard they can actually eat 3000 mosquitoes in one night for free that's called ecological services. What's the main threat to turtles in the gorge and the turtles many places? We have two turtle species in the gorge and actually Oregon and I think in Washington. What is their main threat? This is the western pond turtle. 
bullfrogs. And if I'd been home, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, speaking at the Columbia Gorge Ecology Institute, uh, we would have done Jeremiah was a bullfrog. But bullfrogs are, are uh, huge predators on uh, both the painted turtle below and the pond turtle above. In fact, the poor pond turtles, a lot of them have radio transmitters on them. And when they hatch, they're dug out and sent to the Oregon Zoo uh, to, to grow and to a point where bullfrogs no longer eat them and then they return to the gorge. By the way, turtles can only eat, is that what I'm... only swallow while in the water. Question number three. What is the cutest mammal, animal in, in North America that was voted the cutest wild animal? Uh, it's not this, though it could have been, this is the Ewok from Star Wars. It is this, it is the American pika, tiny little creature that goes meep, meep, meep. It lives in talus slopes and I will say no more because uh, Joanna Varna will be giving a great talk on April 14th, except that even though these look like rodents, they're actually related to rabbits or hares. Cuteness, no doubt. Question four. What great flyer did the Yakima Nation people deem the Thunderbird? What great flyer? It's a California condor, our largest Amer North American land bird, critically endangered. And to be fair, uh, these birds haven't been seen in the gorge for a long time. Lewis and Clark shot one on Wind Mountain, but they have been recently released in Northern California, Southern Oregon. So maybe in 2021, they will show up. Next question, what bird builds the largest nest on the planet? Do, 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 that's Jeopardy. It's bald eagles, our very own bald eagle. These are eagles at the Dow's Dam and I would encourage you this next weekend or especially toward the end of the month to go to the Dow's Dam because there may be more than 120, 130 eagles. Right now there's about 40 bald eagles at the Dow's Dam. They do build the biggest nest of, of any bird. And you notice in the middle, there's a couple of, of immature bald eagles. They get their, quote, bald white feathers at about age five. And now for the most important question of the evening. I wish I could see people's hands raised. You know, does Bigfoot exist? And uh, I think it probably does. There are many people I, I, I have been in contact with that swear they've seen them. You talk to Native peoples and, of course, Harry in the Henderson's movie. But uh, does Bigfoot exist? There are 10 to 15 grizzly bears in Washington state. No one's ever seen them. If, if a grizzly bear can hide, maybe this creature. How does one become enchanted by wildlife? When I was eight years old, I came across a red fox like this one in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania. That moment, some reason, somehow, I decided to become a wildlife biologist. It didn't happen until I turned 35, but it is these magical moments with other creatures that can have a profound, positive, lifelong impact on us. A little bit about me. I, as Sarah said, a wildlife biologist, 30 years with the Oregon Fish and Wildlife and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife written a couple books. And it's really funny to me that uh, when I, I got this picture of the Don't Run From Bears book, at the bottom it says, this is not the actual book cover. I don't see why they can't actually have the actual one, but that's the actual one. So yeah, lifelong, uh, not lifelong, but 30 years, it seems like lifelong in, in the gorge, specifically in Lyle. And uh, Sarah's right. I love uh, sharing uh, information about the natural world and wildlife with everyone. So let's begin with Menacing Wildlife. You must be very thankful, as I am, we don't have giant squids. That'd be a problem crossing the Hood River Bridge. So here are uh, five uh, species of wildlife. Certainly at least three of them are considered by most people as, quote, menacing, as dangerous to humans. But there's only really one that we need to worry about. And in your mind, I wonder what you're all thinking. Let's find out what is the number one by far animal that causes more deaths and injuries to people than all of these combined, in fact, all other wildlife combined in the gorge and the country. And that would be our friends, the deer. Wait a second, well, this just can't be true, can it? Well, in the United States, 1.5 million deer accidents occur every year. And every year there seems to be a percentage increase with that. Deer collisions sadly cost, uh, cost 200 deaths $1.1 billion 
in property damage every year. And if I were to ask you with a question, you know, how many of you have hit a deer or almost hit a deer, know someone who has, perhaps all of you would raise your hand. So uh, what do you do? What do you do when uh, you, a deer crosses the road? Hopefully uh, you have some time to react. Uh, if it just jumps out, then of course you don't. What can we do? Well, the first thing to do is to slow down, obviously. Slow down to as much of a crawl as you can safely. And this may seem counterintuitive, but go straight toward the animal. Never swerve, never swerve. It's my safety lesson. Bad things always happen when you swerve. You swerve to the right, you fall down the bank into the river, swerve to the left, oncoming traffic. You don't want to stop because there are a lot of curvy roads in the gorge. Honk your horn, I find that helps. And always expect that there may be more than one deer. This animal uh, might be considered menacing. It, uh, it is one of the few animals that's actually attacked me and a group of wildlife biologists. So uh, it doesn't care who it attacks. This is the, the Northern Gossok. It's the largest forest raptor that we have. And um, you don't want to mess with it when it's nesting like it is here. A group of biologists, including myself, were doing surveys for this bird. And they do let you know when, when, uh, when they're a little bit agitated, they go, kuk, 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 and uh, so we saw one coming at us, just like the one above, and we all, you know, dove into the bushes and we're fine. The gentleman below, not part of our group, uh, did not fare so well. So, uh, Gossok, you just have to be a little bit careful about. A lot of people think bears are very dangerous and they, they deserve their um, distance, maybe. Um, we don't have any grizzly bears in the gorge. We do have cinnamon-colored uh, black bears. When I was recently serving for Western Gray Squirrels in Wasco County, it came across some other bear and two cubs in the tree. It was so exciting. The, the biologist I was with, I said, get your camera, get your camera. As soon as I said that, the mother bear started sliding down the tree. Now, I, as you saw, I wrote this book called Don't Run From Bears. But in this case, I thought it was a prudent idea to at least uh, run away. I mean, sorry, walk away from a bear, not run, not run, because bears can run as fast as a horse for a short distance. So I slowly walked away and we had no problems. Baby rattlesnake in a little soda pop, twist off. They can have um, venom, but it's not as, uh, it, it, it's less, I'm sorry. They can be, their venom can be just as imp, uh, uh, potent as an adult, but it's usually less. A lot of people get bit by rattlesnakes in the country, seven to 8,000 with annually just five fatalities. And if you get bit by a rattlesnake, the action really is clear. You might find this actually a little funny in some ways, but they really the main thing to do is to try to stay calm. Try to stay calm. Uh, if venom is in your blood system, get to a hospital. They have anti-venom. Uh, again, very few fatalities from this. Whatever you do, don't do what I was told in first aid class many years ago, and that's try to suck out the venom because then it gets into another part of your body. Mountain lions, they come up on many people's list of being menacing and dangerous. And I will not say that they should not be uh, you know, considered wary and you need to you know, know what to do if you see one in mountain lion country, which is everywhere. But their uh, danger is way, 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 way um, overemphasized. Um, whenever I, 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 I hear about a mountain lion being in an area, it's, it's just blasted on all the, the, the radio waves and TV and media. And remember what this animal does. It eats the most dangerous animal that, uh, that we have. People don't get hit uh, mountain lions on, on with cars, they hit the deer. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about this uh, animal because it is just very important for the ecology. Predators like wolves and lions kind of run the animal kingdom's version of Meals on Wheels. They distribute food on a regular basis on many other species. Wolves hunt more than lions do, but lions tend to dismantle a carcass and leave fewer scraps. Wolves do, sorry. And mountain lions are not inclined to fight over their uh, recent kill like uh, wolves are. So that means there's more food uh, left over. Lions, uh, a lot of them have been radio collared. The most famous one in the world, I think, was radio collared. It showed up in a photog uh, photograph beneath the Hollywood sign in Los Angeles. A 2012 study found that these cats 
leave more food available to other species than really any other animal. 39 species of birds and mammals feeding on, on kills in the Yellowstone area. And that's the highest diversity ever recorded in a scavenger study in the world. The critically endangered condor filling on a, a feeding on a lion kill here. So in Klickitat County recently, there's been just a, a wave of, of needless killing of mountain lions. I think we're up to almost 30. And so I would hopefully ask folks that might be involved with that to uh, you know, rethink that because it's a really important part of the ecosystem. They have um, an enormous home range. And so if they're here today, they're probably gone tomorrow. So that's it for, for Medicine Wildlife. So we move on to the magical one. I don't know if this is Darvel Lloyd or not, but this is his place, the Lloyd Brothers Mount Adams. So, um, you know, who, who would really want to uh, live here, I wonder? You know, the Yeti or uh, mountain goats, what creatures would prefer living in sub-zero temperatures with speed of snow? And this animal does. Say hello to the Cascade Red Fox. We know it's related to the uh, common red fox because of its uh, white tail tip. Biologists have captured a few of them, took a number of skin and blood and genetic hair samples, and they simply didn't line up to its cousin, the feral uh, red fox that we're all familiar with. The mountain fox lives uh, continuously uh, a, a lot over 6,500 feet. So it's pretty cool, you know, not everything has been discovered in this world. Every year there are species, even of mammals that are newly discovered. And the question is, is this a brand new species of, of mammal right here living in the gorge? Local wildlife biologist, Jocelyn Atkins runs the Cascade Carnivore Project. And if you love charismatic uh, megafauna, please support Jocelyn's important research. There's a difference between the Cascade fox and the typical red fox. Notice again, the white tail tip. Where is this? Where is this? Well, this is Lao, Washington. This is where I've been living the past 30 years. This photo is quite old and um, it's a very scenic town. But the reason I included two pictures here is because it has really high biodiversity. Lyle, white salmon, Benjamin, Hood River, or where east and west meet, east and west, you know, uh, areas with, with various different species botanically. They include habitats from both the east and west, both the forest and the prairie. Now, I'm not showing you pictures of the Amazon, but at first glance, you would think this is a snake that, that might be there for me from the southwest or something, but this is phenomenal, this snake. It's not a coral snake. It is the California mountain king snake and has a very, very slight, uh, very narrow slice of habitat in the woodlands of uh, Klickitat County in Skamania County. Pretty magnificent. Map. The alligator lizard is our largest lizard, about 10 feet. I'm sorry, 10 feet. That's pretty funny. 10 inches long. And uh, I hate almost to say this, but today on, on uh, when I was walking up the hill near Lyle, I saw one of these guys and I'm going, it's too early. It's too early to be out. But um, anyhow, there it was. Here's your scientific term of the night, caudal anatomy, caudal anatomy. And this is that uh, many species of lizards will slough off their tail when danger approaches, and then they will grow it back. A lot of interesting medical science revolves around how can we grow back limbs that we lose. Sometimes this, the lizards grow back two tails. I've never seen a blue like this in nature. This is an animal you can find around Lyle as well. Other places east of where I'm speaking in Hood River, this is the Western Skink. Lyle area, Mosier, even parts of the Dalles, Hood River are famous for their oak woodlands. This is the most important wildlife tree in the Pacific Northwest and because of the loss of elm, uh, elm trees, this is really the number one wildlife tree in the nation because of acorns. Acorns are a power pack seed and, and that uh, is used by uh, you know dozens and dozens of wildlife, especially in the wintertime. Native Americans utilize this as a source of food 
um, for millennia. The second reason why oaks are really important for wildlife is they have a natural ha uh, tendency to self prune. So during the storm, like we had last night, a lot of branches might fall off and then rot sets in. And so you have these holes or cavities uh, that are utilized by just dozens of different species, including the acorn woodpecker, which for years was only found in, in, in oak woodlands and they're allowed now it's branching out. And you can see what they do, they kind of uh, cache their acorns for further, uh, sorry, further use. And uh, they're strikingly bird, they, they like to fly around in flocks and uh, just spectacular. The Western Gray Squirrel have appearance by Renwick, the Western Gray Squirrel tonight. Say hello to everybody, Renwick, there you go. One of the largest squirrels in the nation, it really is the totem animal of the uh, Oregon white oak uh, woodlands. In Washington, they're protected as state threatened. In Oregon, you can actually hunt them. Uh, their nests are pretty amazing. They're basketball size, usually built against the trunk of the tree. And it's the way they're protected in Washington state. So if you see something like this, let folks from Fish and Wildlife know so they can put them in their database and maybe you'll see uh, Renwick and his friends. Talk about magical. You probably all know what this bird is. It's the American Dipper or Water Oozle. A lot of times you see them just uh, going like this. And they're amazing because um, their whole life is spent in their water, rushing water, streams, rivers, waterfalls, and they build their nest next to the water and their eggs. Their eggs are sprinkled by the mist of the waterfall or the cascades. So they are high on my list. 2017 doesn't seem like that long ago, does it? That uh, was when the Gorge Fire happened. Was it a disaster? No. Ecological ruin? Uh, really, not at all. At the time, there was one wildlife species that was kind of in the shadows, almost waiting for this fire to happen, and that's the black-backed woodpecker. It's an animal that magically shows up after fires, like other woodpeckers, actually, and it'll spend years doing free ecological service of getting rid of those insects that are either in the wood or they come by after the fire. The back, it looks like soot, doesn't it? And so I think it's a wonderful name. Saving the best for last, and speaking of bugs, this is the is the is maybe the most magical animal of all. And I had no idea we even had these guys in the Columbia River Gorge until one night my wife and I were walking back from our neighbor house and we saw white lights on the path of the road. And they were the Northwest species of the glowworm. Again, I was gonna play a little music here, the glowworm song, but can't do it tonight. Pretty amazing that they can do this. Not only wish we had this in the gorge, to be honest, it's not in the gorge, but uh, the glowworms can put on uh, quite a show. Now we come to magnificent wildlife. And again, I, my bias is, is all wildlife is really magnificent. We're turning to the gorge forest to celebrate the resurrection almost of a species that were considered extirpated in Washington state, at least called the Pacific Fisher. Pacific Fisher, uh, raccoonish sized bird, but, but uh, leaner. And many of them have been released um, throughout the state of Washington, including here in the Columbia River Gorge. And the, the last word I heard from the biologists to release them is they're doing quite well and they have produced young. 260 fishers have been, um, been released. Remember the weasel family, they have an affinity for large trees, especially big logs referred to as tree wolverines. One of the few creatures who will happily make a meal out of porcupines. We haven't spent much time this evening in the Eastern part of the gorge, pretty amazing, the wide open expanses of, of uh, what is called shrub steppe, high desert, if you will. And one of the most interesting denizens and kind of, again, a keystone wildlife species in this area is the American badger. This animal is just totally physically built for life underground. It's got phenomenally sharp claws. Notice its body, it's stocky, low to the ground body. And this, this animal produces, makes a lot of holes and when it abandons them, Species move in, you know, rabbits, uh, burrowing owls and others 
So it's really important. You can see in the state of Washington, the green areas there, the east of the Cascades, where they live. Because of uh, climate change, uh, badgers are uh, both decreasing and increasing. The invasive plants in the lower areas allow for uh, less prey uh, to eat, but um, also in the higher areas, um, the uh, habitat is becoming better for them. So we're seeing less badgers in the Columbia Basin and more in the East Cascades. So, you know, sometimes, you know, pet, pet owners start looking like their, um, their pets. So let's see, I'm gonna take off my glasses here. This may be happening as, during the slideshow. And so uh, I'm gonna be turning into, we just met the badger, the most important animal maybe of the high desert for what it does for others. And now uh, I'm gonna turn into the most important perhaps species next to the mountain lion in the forest, if I can figure this out, there we go. And they also have a really hard head here. Maybe some of you know about this. If you've ever been in the secrets program for fifth graders, you know that I've turned myself into the pileated woodpecker, the largest woodpecker in the country. If Seth Tippett's on this call, Seth and I both hope and believe that the ivory-billed woodpecker still exists. So the coolest thing about the, the pileated woodpecker is that one, it makes uh, these holes for nesting. And again, in big trees and when it's done, big animals can move in. The second amazing thing about them, and I'll take off my costume for a second, is their tongue. Look at this, the tongue goes behind its skull, then out through the beak. And if you can notice here, I hope that the picture shows the bristles, almost like barbs of a barbed wire at the tip. And what they're doing is, is they, they, they have the tongue go into the holes of trees. And if you're a termite or an ant, which they mostly prey upon, you know, that animal is toast. So that is pretty amazing. Sad to say, there are no mountain goats uh, left on Mount Hood. If you see a mountain goat in a wild area, you have to go to the Mount Adams, Mount Rainier, and Mount Jefferson, or the Columbia River Gorge. I couldn't believe my great luck when someone just a couple of weeks ago sent me a picture of this mountain goat that came from Mount Adams or the Goat Rocks and is now just hanging out in Skamania County by um, uh, Highway 14. So that's pretty cool. The good news is um, mountain goats, you know, are on the move. This picture is not photoshopped. It's taken in the Palouse country near Pendleton, certainly not in its rightful habitat, but hopefully it'll find maybe some nice uh, lands in the, you know, in the Blue Mountains. Any idea what this animal is? Caused a lot of stir just a few years ago when the first photographs of wolves uh, in the gorge, really of Mount Hood National Forest uh, uh, were, were, were found. So uh, they have moved uh, south, but hopefully uh, someday they will return. I've received lots of photos of, of animals that appear to be wolves in the gorge, but they haven't been substantiated by the powers to be. With no reported attacks uh, on humans in the lower 48 states, wolves really cannot be placed on the menacing category. As you can see by this photo, they take care of their elderly. So the elders, slowest wolves that need the most help with the pack are in the front. And some of the strongest uh, wolves, mature wolves in this pack are in the second there in the yellow with the alpha male, alpha female in the very back so that wolf does not set the pace. It's the elderly wolves that do and the rest of the pack follows. 158 wolves in Oregon, that's really quite a success story, 22 packs. Here's the area where they now live, those wolves that were found on Mount Hood, the Warm Springs uh, Reservation, this is at least close to that. And there's an interesting theory that these wolves are here even though the prey base of deer and elk and even wild horses is not that good, but they might be there because there aren't too many people around and, and solitude might be more important than an abundant prey base. Here's a map of the known wolf areas. You can see it's quite he uh, heavy in the Northeast part of the state. You can see the White River Pack that I just mentioned um, right above Madras and a few packs 
uh, below. The wolf was just taken off the endangered species list, which I think is a bad idea biologically because there are two reasons that, that, that would uh, allow an animal to recover species. One is numbers, and clearly that the wolves have that. 158 is really, I mean, it's, it's a nice start. But distribution is the second one, and wolves are clearly not found west of I-5 uh, or anywhere in the southeastern part of the state. So I would hope that wolves um, would, would be allowed to be in those spots before they're taken off the endangered species list. California condor is uh, one of the most endangered animals in uh, the United States. In the Oregon Zoo, at a, a facility, they raise them. And they are now very close to us. They're found as in, and uh, I think I might have mentioned this before, Northern California. And who knows, in 2021, you might be looking into the sky and you might see this phenomenal bird. So look to the sky, it's the largest bird, largest wingspan. And as I mentioned before, the Yakima peoples consider them the Thunderbird. So I don't know if this was five minutes or five hours, but I'm coming to close to the end. Our affinity for wildlife is just universal. I don't know if it's just an innate human trait, certainly as children, it's kids. We have a huge affinity for animals. Uh, I, I see little kids, including my own grandkids all the time, just kind of, they see an animal of any kind, you know, domestic or wild and just head straight for it. There's a, there's a huge empathy, compassion, uh, connection with this, these other species we share the planet with. Been working with kids 30 years, you know, outdoors and it, you take them outside, even, even maybe this is a greenhouse, I'm not sure, and, and their sense of wonder and sense of place come alive. And so this is one of the best things we can do for our children is to get them outside, to get them hopefully to see wildlife and to experience the beauty of wild things, sense of place, sense of wonder. As we grow older, we can still keep that sense of wonder in place and that affinity uh, with wildlife if given opportunities and experiences like this. I forgot to tell you that in a mountain lion study that I was involved with in Washington State, we had high school students actually, when the mountain lions were tracked and they were darted and put uh, asleep for a while temporarily, it was the high school kids that did all the measurements. So imagine the, uh, the form that the parents had to sign, but that just, you know, they, they, they developed an incredible love for mountain lions after that experience. But as we grow older, sometimes, you know, our, our, our relationship to wildlife changes. You know, and we live in the gorge and we know that wildlife can impact us. We know that deer eat almost everything in terms of plants, you know. We see wildlife at a distance and it's like, cool. Yeah, I've seen a bear at a distance and we're all excited and really, really happy. But if the bear comes closer, like this bear, you know, it's coming down the tree that, that I noticed, uh, uh, things change. And maybe that's wise to, to, again, be wary and to back off. But I hope we can keep our really great sense of love for species uh, alive. If you can't get outdoors, then I, I, there's so many organizations that now have wildlife cameras. I mentioned Joslyn Atkins, and uh, uh, this is a great way to see wildlife. They're literally cameras set up to see uh, condors and eagles, uh, this case coyotes howling you know, at the moon, I imagine, uh, mountain gorillas, and it's just a spectacular way to start a day or end a day when you can get onto these wildlife cams that are in place. I want to note, uh, Dr. Ellen Donahue at Art in Nature really got me interested in wildlife cams, so highly recommended. This is the one thing we don't want to do. We really don't. We don't want to feed wildlife. Uh, they're just not used to this food. Uh, it brings them into an area where they might just hang out rather than moving around, so that's bad for you know, vegetation. And uh, it sadly, it does do this, you know, uh, um, this is called uh, acidosis, a change of diet, you know, deer like shrubs and stuff, and we just don't want to feed them corn. Also, when you feed, uh, as I said, uh, deer, you know, animals come into the area. The only promise we had in our mountain lion study were for people that, that fed deer and mountain lions. One of them came into the area to go after them. So the key to wildlife is diversity of habitats. You know, you don't find too many species in a field uh, that's just a wheat field, for instance. But the more different kinds of habitats you have in area, that's again, why Lyle and the gorge, the mid gorge is so full of wildlife because we have east and west, as I mentioned, meeting. 
Just want to give a plug and some things you can do for wildlife. Columbia Land Trust has purchased 14,000 acres in the Klickitat and Little White Salmon Basins. Beautiful, beautiful wildlife star-studded lands such as these that you can see right here. I don't think there's really much more important we can do for wildlife than actually conserve, protect, and restore lands. Friends of the Gorge did the same thing. 1,600 acres bought and preserved throughout the Columbia River Gorge. Friends of the White Salmon, phenomenal work. It's a group that uh, Darville and Daryl Lloyd were involved with for years. Uh, the kind of dam removal is one of the largest dams ever removed in the country, and it does huge numbers for salmon and wildlife migrating up and down the river. Planting trees, we know, is one of the most important things we can do for climate. Sandy River Delta exit 18 off of uh, I-84, 1.5 million have been planted. The goal of 2 million, a new group that uh, my daughter, son-in-law formed called Trees of the Gorge wants to do the same for other areas of the Columbia River Gorge. Environmental education, here I am at the Gorge Ecology Outdoor Office. And this is their 25th year, at least 25,000 students in the Gorge have had the wonderful opportunities of being in their classroom, especially the time spent outside learning about ecological concepts applied to a local place. This is my second to last slide. And you might wonder why I'm showing this, another mountain lion. The reason I'm showing this is there are confirmed, confirmed reports of a black panther here in the gorge. <laughs> ah, no, I think that's just spectacular. I would give anything to see this animal. And so uh, I don't know if it's on its way to someplace else, but uh, if you get to see this, let me know and, and I'll, be, I'll be right by. I don't think there's anything more magnificent than uh, either a white or black face of an animal. And to close, perhaps we need a, another and wiser and more mystical concept of animals. We patronize them for their incompleteness, for the tragic fate of having taken for so far below ourselves. And that's when we err, greatly err, for the animal should not be measured by us in a world older and more complete, gifted with extensions of the senses we have lost or never attained living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren, they are not underlings, they are other nations, caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth. I uh, wish you a spectacular new year. I hope we can all get to see each other in person as soon as possible when COVID fades. I hope you get outdoors. I hope you come across magnificent and magical wildlife along your path. And thank you so very much uh, for spending your evening with me. I want to make sure you don't leave, Bill, because we have okay. lots of questions. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> thank you so much. I have my own notes of, of my own questions. And I cannot believe we had a surprise guest with Renwick, the gray squirrel, and the pileated woodpecker right there in your office. I couldn't believe it when they knocked on the door. Would you like me to stop my screen sharing at this point, Sarah? Um, I think, let's see, I think that's probably the best option. We'll go side by side okay. so that folks can see your head a little bit bigger. Um, Thank you everyone for being here. What an absolute delight. That was awesome. And I have a, I, I'm going to get right down to questions because we have some good, good ones here. How um, long did that take? What time is it? Oh, it's 748. It Not bad. You did great. You did great. Stumbling and mumbling. There we go. Here my we go. Mom, my mom is is tuning in from Central Oregon. She said you're on her new cool man mantle. So she's wow. She's what an honor. Thank you, Sarah's now. mom. Very nice. <laughs> um, so okay, let's get down to questions. Holly wants to know: Can you say a few words about recreational pressure on wildlife and wildlife habitat, and how to prevent it from getting worse in the future, as more people move here? build homes and play outdoors. So how do we balance this? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, recreation and, and next to habitat loss is probably the number one impact, negative impact to, uh, to wildlife in the gorge and the forest service is a tough, tough challenge in terms of the very popular sites. But more and more we're seeing quotas being put on, a uh, multiple number of uh, falls and a couple of places have shuttles that go there. There's a peregrine falcon, the fastest bird. I didn't talk about them tonight that lives uh, near uh, Beacon Rock and they close that area when they're nesting. 
So if we can put wildlife on an equal part of recreation, I think it'll work. It's when, you know, we want to put one necessarily over the other. I, I think, you know, wildlife and people can coexist. It's really important for mountain bikers not to cut trails, you know, I, and I, I know sometimes it's, it's you want to do that, you know, muddy trails and that type of thing or, or a sense of adventure. But yeah, we have to have areas where for one, we can close season lane, people can support and two, um, you know, areas that are, that are completely closed that might, you know, uh, the areas people would love to go to because they have a critical importance to uh, wildlife nesting, denning, or, or, or movement. I think uh, wildlife uh, affectionados and conservationists and the recreation community partner in most things. You know, we can make it work out uh, if we come together, you know, with a sense of community. Um, Anne wants to know, tell us about pine martins in the area. Where are they found? And what, give us a day in the life of a pine martin. If you like Pine Martin, you got to read Brian Doyle's Martin Martin. It's one of the greatest books ever. It's the only book I've ever read where every character, human or non-human, is presented in their best possible light. It is a joy and a thrill, and I'm so glad to have known Brian before he passed. I've never seen a Martin in the Gorge. I've looked and looked and looked, but Brian Doyle was inspired by his time up at Timberline Lodge, where he actually saw a family of Martins. Like fishers, they like uh, old growth forests, so you're going to see them, you know, where the trees are big. And, uh, you know, they, they like to den. I saw one um, in central uh, Washington once chasing a squirrel for fun. Just to see you could get to one place faster, the marn would always win. They really are boreal acrobats. So, yeah, I would look for them. Also, um, our friend Ken Bevis, who is the stewardship coordinator for the Washington Department of DNR, asked landowners to make wood piles, you know, on the ground. And they attract uh, rodents and other prey. And that's also a place to see pine marn. So, yeah, look for them. Here <laughs> at Timberline Lodge, which seems out of place or in a big, a big forest in the National Forest in the Gorge. Um, this is a question I know you know, you mentioned um, Cascades Carver Project, which we'll know about as well. Um, someone was wondering, are there wolverines on Mount Adams? And yes. And just to follow up, I'll let you answer. Let me follow real quick is um, Corey thinks they might have seen one on the Southwest side of Mount Adams the animal had a bushy tail, so probably a silver fox. And then they followed up saying they were sightseeing at Horseshoe Meadows in August. So first question, are there wolverines on Adams? And second of all, what is maybe this animal she, um, they saw in August? Yeah, wolverines are really, really rare. That's one animal I haven't seen. Uh, I think Joslyn Atkins, along with the Yakima Nation and the uh, Forest Service, found got one on film a few years ago at Mount Adams, and it, it was one of the first ones ever seen in modern times. So they are there. They are denning at Mount Rainier for the first time. So they we, we will count them in as our gorge animals. They're the largest weasel, and they're much maligned in terms of, I just, some people think they're really ferocious and dangerous, which they're not. Uh, I've never seen a cascade uh, a fox yet. I have had people send me pictures. One person was skiing on uh, uh, Mount Hood Meadows and said, what is this animal? I'm going, that's that's this brand new species or brand new subspecies. So um, photographs really help, you know, or just really good descriptions. So uh, was it Corey that wanted the, yes. the, the, yep. the yeah, so have yeah, Corey get a hold of me, uh, the land at gorge.net, and we can hopefully confirm that uh, sighting. Very exciting if it's true. Yes, that's awesome. Um, Tina, Tina Castaneras. She Tina, changed, Tina. <laughs> she's changed her morning walk, her daily walk. Um, so that she, that she came across, let's see, her daily walk route because she twice had a run in with a cougar just by an open irrigation line. So she's changed it, but she's wondering um, what sort of safety precautions is a woman or even as anyone walking alone in cougar country, what kind of precautions would you recommend she take? Great, great, very important question. I would not say here, kitty, kitty, for sure. They would, they might come. But along with bears, and, and you know, it, it's important to look as, as tall as you can. If you have a coat, you know, make yourself look even bigger. If you can get onto a stump, a picnic table or something along the way, uh, that's something that uh, seems to, to take away cats. They're, for some reason, they tell you not to look them in the eye uh, with mountain lions. Back off slowly. Uh, and um, if the worst comes to worst and, and uh, uh, you know, there's a fight, you know, fight back. You don't want to play dead. That's what all the wildlife agencies talk about. I have a mountain lion walk right by me. As I mentioned, we, uh, we, we, uh, with high school kids, we tagged uh, 25 of them. And so I, I just have yet to have a bad experience with them. Um, I, I think for Tina that, that uh, this, this mountain lion will only be in, one, in the same area unless it, 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 it's had to kill there. 
if it made a kill, that's the only reason for them to stick around uh, after the, the, the food is eaten, they, they will take off. They have enormous home ranges. They're here today and gone, um, gone tomorrow. And if you feel a little bit uneasy, grab a couple of friends to, to join you on the walk. Um, let's see, I've just got, just got word in that there are definitely foxes at Horseshoe Meadows. Yeah. That's from, that's from Jocelyn Akins, who will hopefully rope into a future Sense of Place chat. Yes. Um, let's see. Congratulations. Way to go, Corey. <laughs> um, oh, Tina also wanted to know, are there moose in our region? No, but they're another animal on the move. Okay. You know, they're really all over the Spokane area, I'm told. They've come from, been from the north, and I, I wouldn't doubt that someday, somehow, somewhere, they'd be here. I don't know their closest location, but they are on the move. Okay. Nicholas wants to know, why does ODF and W and WDF and W often hunt or cull cougar that kill or attack people, even in rural, remote areas that are away from towns? Well, I do not work for those agencies anymore, um, but... Uh, I don't, I, I don't think there's, there, there, there's, there's a good answer to that. If an animal has been found to have attacked a human, then I, that, is a, that is an animal that probably should be at least you know, removed at a, you know, and, and that's, that's a very strong safety situation. Some people lose livestock to, to, to mountain lions and uh, you know, if that's your business and they continue to come back and you can't you know, find a way to stop them. You know, these are tough societal uh, you know, questions. But uh, the people of Washington, I think, and Oregon, I, I've spoken in, in, in referendums and initiatives before that really, you know, spoke in favor of mountain lion. So I can hope again we can come to a, a good medium. If a mountain lion does something once, you know, that's not, uh, you know, in, injurious, but maybe is in an area and starts showing up, you know, capturing it and taking it to another spot is one thing. It doesn't really work, though, because mountain lions are strongly territorial. They do not allow other animals in their area. And that's why when people say mountain lions are everywhere, it's really not true because they uh, have enormous areas of territory that they don't allow other mountain lions necessarily to join them in. Um, you mentioned a little bit just related about some of what was going on um, with mountain liger, lions and, you know, and um, what are also called cougars in Klickitat County. And someone was wondering, what, what do we do about Click Attack, the Click Attack County Sheriff and um, his shooting cougars? Do you have any suggestions for a, a complicated situation over there? You may need to give a little background for folks who are not familiar um, with what's going on. And I can point people to Colum a recent Columbia Insight article that explains some of what's happening. Yeah, I don't know why it was started. Actually, it might have been uh, started with the Fish and Wildlife uh, uh, Wildlife uh, Patrol officers who were spending, and this is, this is verbal communication with at least one of them, that they were spending all their time responding to mountain lion calls. And so they were hopeful to get more folks involved and trained to be able to respond to that. But I think from there, which actually makes a lot of sense, to you know, indiscriminate killing of mountain lions whenever they show up, whether they're a threat or not, is 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 very disappointing, and we 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 see how important they are uh, to the ecological you know uh, equivalents and other animals. But the problem with with indiscriminate shooting of mountain lions is that a lot of times you take the the, the most mature males or females, and those are the ones that rarely rarely interact with people. But then you have the yearlings and, and, and uh, the, I hate to say the juveniles, but younger cougars, and they're much more prone to roam and to, to be curious and to get into people's businesses. And so we're actually making things worse. So there's a group called the Mountain Lion Foundation that has come to, to Click Attack County and, and trying to get people involved and trying to convince the sheriff and the deputies to, uh, to cease, you know, doing this, because it just, it, there's really no rationale, ecological or really safety reason to do it. Well, in the piece that you were saying earlier, where you likened some of these larger animals to um, sort of meals on wheels, I was curious, I, I want to make sure I understood it right. So in the case of a mountain lion, they, they get their prey, they eat some of it, but in the process, they're leaving some of it. So then a huge number of other species are able to eat it. Correct. And why, I'm curious, why do they not eat the whole thing themselves? I'm clearly not a, a wildlife biologist, but. Well, sometimes they, 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 they <laughs> killed more than they can eat for one. 
Uh, two other animals may come and chase them away. Three people may find it. And uh, bound lines try to stay away from people. I wish I'd shown you a map of Clay Elm, Oregon, where we did our work. Uh, Clay Elm, Washington, sorry. And if, if my fist here is where people live, and the mountain lines that we tracked and put radio collars on were all around, but never they, they stayed away from they stayed away from uh, people. So yeah, it's it's a it's the you know the mountain lions are the top of the food chain, and so all these other animals underneath them. You know, especially in wintertime when it's, you know, really hard to find uh, food. Mountain lions, they, they kill something. And uh, I also believe this is true that if, they, if, if they're, um, they make a summer kill and the prey becomes rancid, that they won't, they won't come back to it either. Um, sort of related, I know we've got a lot of cougar questions here. Um, Felton's wondering, do you think the impact from cougars, um, and I think he was going to say cougars and wolves on deer or elk populations is significant. Some hunters do, but I'm a hunter and I don't think so. I do think that cougars and wolves will change their behavior, which certainly makes them seem less abundant. So he's, it sounds like there's this idea that some people are feeling that cougars and wolves are um, impacting deer and elk in negative ways. Um, do you have any sense for that? Well, yeah, it's, it's, and congratulations for having an open mind on this uh, to, to the person who asked the question. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, one of the most amazing studies of all was in Yellowstone when wolves were reintroduced there. And they found riparian areas and areas that had been totally denuded by uh, elk to totally return and re be restored. And so many other wildlife species moved in when these riparian, these streamside areas got better because the, the, uh, the, uh, the mountain lions and the wolves keep the deer and the elk on the move, which is a good thing rather than hold up in one, in, in one spot. So sure, they eat deer and elk. And so that's, that's going to have an impact on the species. But I think, I think their, their positive ecological role off weighs that. And, and I mean, they're not going to kill all of the deer and elk. And some years they are eat more where there's, there's more prey. And some years they have to diversify their diet. I saw a mountain lion with a turkey in its mouth, a wild turkey once going down the road with two of its, its kittens. So, um, yeah, it's really complicated. And unfortunately, you know, some folks really uh, denigrate mountain lions because they think they are taking out the deer and elk. But if the deer and elk don't have good habitat, you know, then then that's going to be a much bigger impact. Deer are really suffering. Deer are really suffering in the gorge and in other shrub step lands. Elk are doing much better in terms of their population, I'm told. Related to that, the habitat piece, as we're losing ponderosa pines, someone wanted to know how is that going to affect or wildlife, and maybe talk a little bit about what's going on with ponderosa pines first. Well, climate change has uh, allowed for uh, a number of detrimental insect species to come in, and they they will kill. Uh, well, in the northwest, millions of acres of, of trees. Fires actually help offset that because they not only they sometimes kill the trees, but they kill up the insects. So yeah, there are not too many ponderosa pine obligate species, which means species that actually need pine, but there are a few. One is the white-headed woodpecker, and which you can find up in, in, in Glenwood. So um, what happens is when trees die, it, more animals actually come in. So, uh, you know, millions of acres is obviously problematic, but on a smaller scale, there's more life in a dead tree than there is in a live tree because the trees have their defenses, but when they die, so many different species come in. A friend of mine had his home actually, his land burned up in Northern Washington a few years ago. And it wasn't that wildlife disappeared, it's that a whole new equivalent of wildlife, including the blackback woodpeckers uh, came in. But uh, yeah, we're gonna, yeah, making sure that the trees are you know thin, that we focus on the bigger trees are really important. Prescribed burns is one of the best things we can do to eliminate widespread fire. Prescribed burn is when you actually come in and you burn, you know, in the winter time when the, 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 um, the risk of a large scale fire is less. And they've done some of that in the gorge near Lyle. We have a question from Nora, who is six years old. Nora, thank you Nora. for being here. She would like to know how long a cougar generally lives for. Well, animals in the wild live much less than they do in a zoo. Or, you know, it, 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 you know, our own pets, you know, have uh, the comforts of home. I don't exactly answer to that. I'm sure you could look that up, Nora. I, I bet it's somewhere about 12 to 14, 15 years seems about right. But uh, yeah, you can tell a lot from a, an older cougar. Their teeth, you know, start wearing out and they, they just like, 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 like people. So I saw one that... Um, 
Uh, I don't know what how old it was, but it was very, very thin and, and uh, had a hard time finding food. And I think that's because it had gotten, gotten oh, it's not easy living out in the woods. People forget about that for all wildlife. It's tough, especially, you know, in the winter time to find food, to find water, to have to deal with people all the time is, is really difficult. But Nora, I hope uh, you get outdoors and I hope, uh, I hope you find out exactly how old they live so you can tell me, that would be good. Speaking of that, um, you mentioned a number of different organizations. I'm curious for folks who have tuned in tonight and, and would love to work in some sort of role like a citizen scientist. You know, I know doing surveys on hundreds of acres of land, that takes a lot of work. Is there any um, upcoming or current citizen science opportunities out there or places you could point people who are interested in wildlife and want to help out in one way or another? Yeah, well, the main, one of the main things you can do is when you see an animal and you can uh, you, you know, hopefully identify it, the wildlife agencies really want to know about many species. There are a lot of species. There's a white-tailed ptarmigan, which is a bird that turns white, like the snowshoe hare up in the mountains. And that animal seen, fish and wildlife people would love to see that mountain goat. If you're up in Mount Hood and you see a mountain goat, that would be really helpful to know because the, the Oregon Fish and Wildlife folks told me they do all these helicopter surveys and haven't seen one for years. Martin, Fisher, the people that release the Fisher want to know where they where they're headed. So Jocelyn Atkins is the right person to talk to. She uh, does incredible field work. I think, hopefully Jocelyn, if you're on the phone, this is true, um, that you do need volunteers. She has all these cameras out and it's really fun to, to take the film out of the cameras and to see what animals have been, have been by these various locales. So those are the two things I'd recommend is report your, your wildlife findings to folks. Put you, there's different ways you can put them on phones, you know, and share them with the public or Facebook. Uh, and also um, work with the Cascade Carnivore Project and plant trees, plant trees, especially, you know, in the gorge, the native trees are really important. So you actually had habitat back to the, to the land. I want to do a quick report then, a live report from Paul Moyer, who said a pine marten was observed for 10 minutes on Mount Hood, east side on Timberline Trail in old growth, Mount Hemlock. That's Paul and Janet. So reported here. Paul, hopefully, uh, if it needs to go to someone else, you can follow up on that. Um, I know, I know both of them, and that is a, that I call a confirmed sighting. And there you go. And he mentioned the word old growth, so again, looking for pine martens in an area where big trees would be the place to go. Thank you, Paul and Janet. Good news. Um, what about skunks in the gorge? Mark wants to know about skunks. I haven't seen too many skunks lately. I haven't seen any porcupines lately. That's a real strange thing. We don't know what has happened to them. Skunks are the farmer's best friend. They are ones that eat more insects that are uh, damaging of crops than almost any other animal. So despite their uh, their scent and odor, uh, they are really important. They're mostly nocturnal. So again, you wouldn't have a hard time hard time seeing them. Yeah, I'm sure you you smell them first. And by the way, someone wrote me the other day, says, Bill, how do I get rid of a skunk odor and, and, and you know, scent from my clothes? And, I, and, and they said, do you try tomato juice? And I'm going, it's time. I've been directly <laughs> sprayed and believe me, it, it's a few days at least. Um, are, are you doing okay on time, Bill? I, don't want to keep I am so thrilled at all these questions and all, all these friends and new friends that we're meeting. There's a ton of great questions. Okay, we've got a quick citizen science opportunities via wildlife web cameras at explore.org. That's from Ellen Donahue. Yes, perfect, Ellen, thank you. So there is an idea. Um, speaking of cameras, someone was wondering if you have any recommendations for like a backyard wildlife cam, if they're curious about what's wandering through their backyard during the day. Yeah, that's fantastic. And almost any any sporting goods store, I think Big Five for sure sells it. We can get them online. The price seems to have gone down. I think the last one I bought was maybe $60. And yeah, those are fantastic. Uh, I, I've seen mountain lions. I've seen these cascade fox on them, uh, coyotes, you know, and it was the wolves seen on one of those exact cameras that informed us that a pack had for the first time in decades been found on Mount Hood. Um. I missed, I, I was writing something down when I heard you talking about Black Panther. And so I'm glad that Pam asked this because she goes, I thought the Black Panther was only in Florida. Same species? Was this, did I hear you right? <laughs> the Black Panther uh, that I shown was a melanistic coloration of, black, uh, of a mountain lion. Got and it. a mountain lion that is black in coloration has been observed now by a few folks very recently in the gorge, which is astonishing. And that's why I ended with that slide. 
Okay. Got and, and other other big cats, I'm told, also have that. So jaguars, maybe leopards. So it's just a pigment situation that I'm not sure why it happens. It's really rare, though. Okay. And where was the sighting? Do you? I don't want to tell you. Okay. Gonna, <laughs> sorry, Kathy. Kathy's not going to tell you. <laughs> All right. Remember, um, this is an animal that ranges hundreds of miles. So wherever you live in the gorge, you know. Here today, gone tomorrow. Here today, All right. Gone tomorrow. Talk to us about wind turbines. Another yeah, sort of wind turbines. Dilemma. Yeah, I, I, I was uh, dealt with a lot, most of the wind turbine projects in Klickitat County. And um, wind turbines in areas that are like farm fields and all the wheat fields of eastern Oregon, eastern Klickitat County are perfect places to put them because they have very little impact to birds. But unfortunately, some of the turbines have been placed in very high value wildlife area uh, habitats, especially on ridge tops where a lot of birds of prey uh, congregate. So we've had a bald eagle death. We've had golden eagle deaths. I mean, it really is uh, really problematic. I'm really excited about the next generation of wind turbines that don't have the blades turning. Somehow they 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 somehow can incorporate wind going through them, and so they will have zero impacts to uh, to birds. Also, note that migratory bats they turn off. This thing called echolocation when they migrate. We have two species of migratory bats, and they're just devastated by turbines when they they go through the areas. So it's really a matter of where the wind turbines are sited. I asked the wind turbine companies many times to to mitigate by providing funds for wildlife habitat, and hopefully the next generation of turbines will not be a problem as they are today. Um, related to sort of human influences, Michael wants to know: given the prominence of roads and railroads in the gorge. What are you aware of, if anything, efforts by ODOT and WASHDOT to provide wildlife crossings in the gorge? Which I think it, you could talk some about that in a bigger picture, because I know in learning about sort of the impact of roads, it's not always a natural thing to realize that a road can be a huge detriment to wildlife. So maybe what's going on specifically, but also big picture as well on that. Yeah, there's been a nice movement of overpasses and underpasses for wildlife in areas that have a lot of crossings and, and therefore a lot of deaths, accidental deaths by vehicles. Uh, Washington State has a few of them. Don't know if Oregon does. I think Eastern Oregon might. There's one in Utah that's been all over the news lately. I'm trying to get one uh, near the Sandy River because that's a fantastic wildlife uh, uh, corridor. These are obviously really, really expensive projects, but they have incredible benefit for wildlife. With roads, yeah, roads uh, have a huge negative impact to wildlife, especially again on where they're placed. Are they closed seasonally? And so um, there's some areas that shouldn't have roads, the Forest Service and others, and a huge, huge job nationally in closing duplicate roads, which is really helpful. Wolves, in particular, you know, um, and roads aren't good for poaching and other, you know, they kind of stay away from that. They're wise to people going on them. And so, and we always, talked about deer, you know, it's not deer is medicine, it's just that they, they really cross roads all the time to their detriment and to people's. Um, are turkeys native to the gorge? I don't know if they're historically or prehistorically native, but in the 1960s, they were reestablished near Lyle, up in the hills, very close to where I live, and they have taken off. I mean, they have just, they're everywhere. They've been reintroduced. There's three different kinds of turkeys. I think all of them are here in the Northwest. I think they're getting out of hand. Poor Renwick, some people think they have, they because they're much more aggressive and they eat foods that Renwick could be, uh, you know, threatened by turkeys, you know, and two different species eating the same food. So um, yeah, they, they're very successful wildlife story. Um, talk about sturgeon right now. How are they doing? Do you know about sturgeon? I know a little bit about sturgeon. I really am more the, the four-legged than birds, but, uh, you know, sturgeon, um, really, really important Native American uh, uh, food fish. Um, they, they've they been penned in, you know, they, they're not like salmon. They don't, at my understanding, they don't use the fish ladders or anything like that. So you have these populations that are just between the dams. Uh, I don't know if... Uh, Fish and wildlife agencies and Native American tribes are have, have you know moved them to other locations or what? But the, yeah, they're they're a, a tough species. I um, if you want to see them, go to the uh, Bonneville Dam if it's still open during COVID. Their fish um, window. Um, a little nudge from Anne. She says you don't have to, but if you want to share about the Master Naturalist program, 
Could, Thank you, Anne. I should have had a slide on them. I wanted to, and somehow it got lost. I was afraid I was going to go too long. Yeah, Ann Harris is a wonderful director of the local master naturalist program. And if you want to learn, you know, much, much more from much more qualified people than me, join the master naturalist program. Uh, we weren't able to uh, go on site uh, last year. Hope we can do it this year. You get to see all different parts of the gorge. You get to learn all about fishing, wildlife, flowers, oaks, trees, fires. It's a great group of, of people and uh, I'm happy to be part of it. So yeah, if you're interested for 2021, see Anne, OSU Master Naturalist Program. And I will say, Anne, um, since you'll be talking to us on March 10th, I'll ah. expect for you to mention it again. So tune back in March 10th if you want to hear Anne talk some. Um, okay, let's see. How many links are around the gorge? None, none known. Okay. They're really rare species. I don't think there are any in Oregon and uh, in Washington, they're way up north and near the Canadian border. Um, let's see. Oh, someone's wondering, um, a group, they volunteered with the May Street Secrets 15, 15 years ago. We were wow. an ant. Is the wonderful program still going? It is. It is. It went virtual this past year, but we hope to get back into the classrooms um, and out in, the, in nature, you know, if not this spring, then come fall. So yes, the Secrets program is alive and well up to 25 years. Uh, I've mentioned 25,000 kids have been through it. We're so, so happy that it's still going under great leadership by a gentleman named Drew Eastman. Thank you, Drew. Um, okay, a question from Alder. He is three. And Alder, hello. He's got, a, he's got a tough one, Bill. Oh. Three-year-old Alder wants to know what color the skin of woodpeckers are under their feathers. Wow. I think it's because he, I think he heard about the whole um, polar bear thing, white fur, black skin. So he's, he's curious about the woodpecker. That idea? is a spectacular question. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm really glad to be stumped by a three-year-old. The other question is mostly I knew a little bit about or I was faking it. No, I, I think I knew a little bit about, but that is great. I am writing this down and I'm okay. going to find out. Thank you for that fantastic question. And I hope that you also find out be, even before I get back to you. So that is, wow, that is cool. Good question, Alder. Okay. Um, let's see, I spotted a river otter pair at Hood River Marina. How common are they in the gorge? A lot of people have seen them in various places. So I think their populations are coming back. And uh, boy, yeah, up in Goldendale, I've seen them before. The Hood River Marina, I didn't know about. That's interesting in the, in the Columbia or maybe Hood River. Yeah, they, they are more and more people come to me and say that they've seen them. And there's really few other species that they confuse them with. A mink is much smaller. And so, hooray, nicely done. You proved my point. You get out and you never know what you're going to see. That's great. Okay, we got three people wanting to know about bobcats. We mm -hmm. have bob bobcats. Yeah, bobcats we do have. Uh, I hit one with my car once, which was really horrible. I hope it survived. Yeah, they, uh, unfortunately, if you have chickens, you really got to watch out for them. They are really fond of chickens. So keep your chicken inside, at least at night. Other animals really like them too. Yeah, they're really cool cat. They're really small tail. They, uh, their cat prints are much smaller than a mountain lion's. So that's one way to tell them the different. Also the tail of a mountain lion seems to go on forever. But yeah, I think they're fairly common here. They have a varied diet and um, yeah, I hope you see one. They're spotted and uh, great. Yeah, I think they're, I think they're generalists. I, I think they, they're much closer to the towns and the rural areas than mountain lions would be in other animals. Someone was saying they say a bob they saw a bobtailed cat cross the state road just out of Mosier, about the size of a lynx. So maybe yep. that was a bobcat. Okay. Yeah, lynx has huge paws, huge ear tufts, and again, it would be a phenomenal sighting to see one that we just have haven't heard of them being in this area. Um, let's see. Do you know if the Rowena Wildlife Clinic is still doing things to support um, injured wildlife? Yeah, and I can't believe I didn't mention that, that you know, we lost some folks that were on That's the- That's why we're here. we're here, we're here. Yeah, wildlife is run by a saint, someone who should win the Nobel Prize, I think, uh, Dr. Jean Seifer, and uh, she has been uh, running a clinic where, where any animal that is injured, any animal uh, is taken there. She will do her best with her staff to rehabilitate. She's in Mosier. She has a crew of volunteers that will answer the call if you see an injured animal. And uh, I think she's, <laughs> yeah, she is a fantastic person. And what she does is amazing. 
I'll gather together the various different organizations, including Rowena Wildlife Clinic, and we'll put it on the Sense of Place website. So if in the process of tonight, you guys heard something and you want to follow back up, um, we'll make sure we add it there. Thank um, you. Tell me about her. Yeah. Okay. I want to be careful with your time. I know um, it's a late night. We asked you to go away from your home for it. How, let's see. Talk about beavers. I was told, Philip says, I was told beaver were shy and avoided people. But while kayaking at Meyer Park, a juvenile beaver was not shy. Mm. Doesn't go into details. Also, are beavers doing okay in the beaver state in general? Yeah, these are great questions. The beavers uh, also are making a, a comeback. They're, get, they're very important creature, uh, you know, when they dam small streams, at least, when they dam streams that are near people, flooding is not good, but they hold water back. And so that's good in times of drought and summer. They're really good for providing fish habitat for salmon. So they're very, very important uh, uh, species. There are some uh, places that actually capture beaver from places they shouldn't be and redirect them to places where people would love to have them. I think um, this, uh, the future for beavers is, is, is bright. Trapping has really been somewhat reduced for them and their ecological benefit for this species is really starting to make its way around. Um, okay, I'm gonna wrap things up here real quick before we go to our last few questions with Bill. I wanna let you know that next month we have Zachary Stocks, who's gonna be talking about black pioneers on the Oregon Trail, which is an awesome talk. And Zachary is great. He's the new executive director of the Oregon Black Pioneers. Wow. Um, so you can register for that now. Also, if you didn't see in the opening slides, Dear Neighbor is a local letter exchange that's happening right now. It's a way to connect despite pandemic conditions. So go to the website, check those things out. Um, okay, and then our last few questions for Bill. What about packs of coyotes? Do you call them packs of coyotes? Coy yeah, coyotes, coyotes, you know, people think of them as packs, but they're not really a pack animal. You know, sometimes they would get together, especially around sites that have food and during the, uh, you know, uh, breeding season. But you don't, you don't, not like wolves, you know, that picture I showed of the wolf pack. You no, know, coyotes, a lot of them are solitary, you know, and so they're not a herd animal. They're not a pack animal. So sometimes you hear a couple of them and it sounds like a hundred just because of the way sound travels. But uh, uh, no, that's, they're, they're different than wolves that way. Um, let's see. Oh, let me see one more thing about coyotes. Yeah. Is a lot of people don't like them. I don't know why people shoot them indiscriminately. But when you kill a coyote, uh, what happens is with, with the female coyotes is they produce larger litters. It's an amazing adaptation. And so by killing coyotes wherever you see them, you're actually probably increasing the population. So it doesn't make much sense. That's good to know. So, hey, speaking of dead animals, not to, not to be a downer, so there are squirrels everywhere, it seems like. I mean, especially when we went into COVID lockdown, like our TV was looking out the front window and just watching the squirrels do their thing. But I feel like you never, or you very rarely see a dead squirrel. For as many as there are, why are there not just dead squirrels and birds and little animals all over the place? I mean, I know they're getting eaten, but it seems like you'd see more of them. Well, sadly, uh, we talked about roads before. For our friend Renwick and gray squirrels, they have a propensity of, of being hit by cars a lot, which is really a problem for a rare species. Other species adapt. Other species are, are swept up right away when they're dead. You know, we have a huge natural garbage service with the uh, scavengers. We don't have the condor, but we have a lot of uh, ravens and crows. During the spring and summer, we have the vultures that come in. So things don't last long out there. It's when, <laughs> when you're looking for food and you see something that's not going to run away or fly away, I think that's one of the reasons. I think squirrels are pretty smart. I think they become adapted to people. A lot of the squirrels we have here are introduced, so they're not even from here. But uh, I think those are some reasons why... Uh, we don't see too many dead animals around. Um, any thoughts on dogs, particularly off leash and their Im impacts specifically on ground nesting birds and other wildlife in popular areas? Thinking a spot like a coyote wall. Yeah, there that's the real that's a real problem. And uh, the area where I work, the Sandy River Delta, allows for off leash dogs, and it's the second most visited spot in the gorge after the Malton and Falls. So it's a real challenge for our work. So yeah, I mean, some areas don't allow dogs, some allow them on leash and they should be on leash for good good measure. It's probably because of, of uh, wildlife concerns, especially in wildlife uh, refuges. But yeah, deer like to chase, I mean, sorry, dogs like to chase. And so um, they can have really negative impacts. They dig up uh, turtle eggs, that's, we've seen that happen. 
And so they can have a, a negative impact. They're also being used positively by wildlife agencies to find wildlife throughout the country. So that's kind of cool. You can actually train an animal to find uh, turtles or other creatures. Okay, last two questions, I, I promise. Um, where do turkey vultures go in the winter? Uh, I think they, they go, go to Hollywood. No, I don't they go, I think they probably go south, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and so, yes, and it's interesting that they're gonna show up like clockwork in about a month or two. And then they, they I'm pretty sure they head south. Whoever's, if Kathy Flick's on this call, she can set me straight. She's the, the gorgeous best burger. Um, and then oh, one more citizen science opportunity is through Columbia Riverkeeper. We'll put that on the website. They've got volunteer programs to do water quality monitoring sites up and down the river. So you'll be out and about. Um, let's see. Great. And then let's, what, Kelly Davis thinks she saw a pygmy owl near Bonneville Dam a few mm -hmm. years ago. They're pretty rare, but she, that's what she thought it was. It was smaller than its prey and the, the which was the bird in its beak. Would that, would you see a pygmy owl by, out by the Bonneville Dam? Yes, pygmy owls are actually not that uncommon. Uh, we've okay. I've heard them in the woods and uh, even where I live. And uh, uh, there's a couple other smaller owls. I mean, I mean, owls about that same size. Uh, they're called, their their hoot, their single note hoot would be helpful, but I'm sure that's true. Way to go. Awesome. Thank you. That oh, was- Thank you. Are there more questions? I don't want to- have people not, I know you, for you, Sarah, we can call well, it quick. I mean, Bill, I will always have more questions. That is the one. Oh, you know what? There was something that got, that got pushed down my list. Some folks were wishing you a happy birthday. Well, that is so kind of them. Yeah, uh, Monday. That's very, very nice. Okay. All right. Happy, happy belated birthday. Um, do you know anything about what um, Leo is calling the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Poison oak ticks, green blister beetles, and scorpions. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people don't like to go hiking in the east part of the gorge because of of ticks. I've lived among them for years, and uh, you know it's just part of life. I think poison oak is more of a of a threat. Uh, cool thing is when a tick attaches to onto a fence lizard, one of our lizards, maybe other lizards too, detox, detoxifies the lime. Um, there's uh, Lyme cures out there. Uh, we have two different types of ticks. One of them causes Lyme, one of them doesn't. The rate of Lyme is low here, but it may increase. Uh, scorpions are really cool. They're really secretive. I don't know much about their impact of one, you know, to sting you here where the muscle ours are much smaller than the ones you see in other places. What were the other two apocalypse uh, ones? It was um, poison uh, oak. Oh, poison oak, yep. Yep. And then, gosh, let me scroll through it. Oh. You know what? I've lost it in my- That's okay. My poison life. oak is, yeah, is one to talk about and it's increasing its range. One of the best ways to get rid of poison oaks is to get goats. There's some folks that actually have them out for rent and you can uh, tether them in a place every day and they will eat the poison oak to smithereens. So. Okay. One last question before you go. What What is your favorite wildlife creature? Well, I am, uh, I am very- uh, <laughs> I love them all, and, and it's hard. And I, I guess I would say it's the uh, the northern spotted owl. Northern spotted owl is the only bird to ever be in the cover of Time magazine. It is uh, very controversial, but was much more when I was with Fish and Wildlife. It's uh, lost most of its habitat. It's been petitioned to be listed as endangered, which is you know the next thing close to extinct. There's a new bird that has showed up called the the barred owl, which has taken over a lot of its territory. So that bird is dear to my heart for about six years, I would uh, capture, not capture them, but I would uh, put out a mouse on a stick. <laughs> and when the, the bird came down to catch the mouse, if it ate it, it wasn't nesting and if it flew away, I had to run and find its its nest. So it's a remarkable species, a symbol of forest and wildlife in the Northwest. So I think that one does. What's yours, Rachel? I mean, Sarah? Well, I mean, I kind of feel like I should be, I should pick the fox, right? <laughs> but I think if I was going to do it, I would have to pick the Cascade Red Fox because it's, so unique and particular and, and has figured out that Mount Adams is a great place to be, so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you everyone who's tuned in. Um, keep an eye on the website. We'll get some more information up there from the talk. Um, Bill's obviously available um, and it was great to see you all and I wish you the very best as we head into the rest of 2021. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you very, very much. And thank you, Sarah and Erica. Good work.